Welcome everybody to our second webinar series at the World Patients Alliance. And uh, on this one, of course, the hot topic is still COVID. Uh, some places around the world are seeing uh, third spikes, fourth spikes, and, and other places are seeing light at the end of the tunnel, uh, thanks to um, vaccines. And so what we wanted to do was bring in some of the leading experts in the world to talk about really what's happening out there in the field. Um, because it seems like every day there's more data coming out every day about who's getting the vaccines and where are they going and what are the some of the issues that are arising. And so we figured let's bring the people that know the most, the people that are making these vaccines and the people that are in charge of their distribution. Because one of the early reports that we saw at the WPA was a, um, a study that showed that early distribution uh, where governments were purchasing the, the vaccines, they were going to the richer countries. And while that may not be surprising, that's not acceptable because it was not the richer countries at that time that needed the vaccine the most. And so we wanted to talk to those that are in charge with vaccine distribution and also talk about some of the hesitancies that uh, they're facing in the world so that all of you can help better educate your members about the importance of getting these vaccines and 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 to educate the policymakers and the stakeholders in this whole arena about the importance of uh, putting patient health first. So Tessa, if you don't mind, I'm gonna just spend a minute or two just bringing everybody up to speed for those who are new to the organization about what the World Patients Alliance is and, and, and who we are, what we do. And uh, so I am Andrew Spiegel. I'm the founding chair of the organization and one of the founding board members. Uh, we decided that we were going to create a global organization for patient organizations to help them accomplish their missions. And so we, uh, we created a mission to be the global voice for patients working toward empowerment and engagement and improved access to safe, innovative, and patient-centered healthcare all the way throughout the world. And of course, our vision is that patients will have access to these safe, high quality therapies and affordable health cares around the world. And so our goal is to be that global voice uh, for all patients everywhere, regardless of disease, regardless of location. And if you go to our website, you'll be able to see a lot more about our mission, our vision, and our statement of principles and things of that nature. We can see that um, the World Patients Alliance has grown significantly since we started. We now have, this is even old already, and this is just a couple of days old. We now have, I think, over 260, uh, knocking on the door of 265 patient group members. And we're literally growing every week. Uh, we represent almost 90 countries around the world. And if any of you have contacts in any of those parts of this map that are not green, at least it looks green to me, um, please help us out because we truly want to represent the entire world and we need patients everywhere in the world to, um, uh, to truly accomplish our mission. Again, I'm Andrew Spiegel, the current chair. Uh, I've been in the colon cancer space for more than 20 years, having co-founded the Colon Cancer Alliance here in the US. And now I run the Global Colon Cancer Association, which is an umbrella organization of the 50 groups around the world dedicated in part or in in full to, um, to colon cancer. Hussein Jaffrey is our next chair. He's the Secretary General of Alzheimer's Pakistan. Penny Cohen, who's on the call today, um, is the uh, founder and CEO of the American Chronic Pain Association. She's got a little bit more time in the uh, arena than I do, about two decades more. So Penny's been around a long time and, and most in the pain space, everybody in the pain space knows Penny. And we have Yolanta Belinsky, who's the Director of Development and Social Communications in Poland. And of course, you heard from Carla, who uh, is the CEO of Esperanta in, in Peru, dedicating her life and her organization to cancer, fighting cancer. And representing um, Africa, we have our Director, Regina Kamaga, she's Executive Director of Community Health and Information. And uh, also on the call, we have our staff. We have Tessa Glenn, who's our director, and Harris Khalib, who has the title of office manager, but who does a whole lot more, uh, as does Tessa. So that's an introduction to the background of, um, of who the World Patients Alliance is. So our first speaker is going to be Laura Mann. 
the uh, Director of Global Government Affairs and Policy Operations at AstraZeneca. She's in charge of everything vaccine. So uh, without further ado, Laura Mann. Just to start off, I think, you know, from, from the outset, um, when, we, when we decided to partner with the University of Oxford, something that we shared in terms of a commitment with, with them was around broad and equitable access to vaccines. And that's something that we've been working on ever since. We're doing that in a number of We've worked with governments around the world. We have over 50 supply agreements with government, including to um, gain funding to expand access to people. Um, way and with significant supply volumes. We've also partnered with multilateral organizations. So we were the first um, uh, uh, organization to partner with COVAX, um, the uh, multilateral initiative, which aims to get vaccines to people around the world, wherever they live, regardless of income level. Um, so we were very proud to, to, to join um, COVAX in June last year at the Gavi Vaccine Summit. And we've been working for a, a year now um, the World Health Organization, PAHO and UNICEF on how we can ensure fair allocation of our vaccine and equitable distribution world. We can talk a little bit more about that. Um, licensing partners such as the Serum Institute of India, our farm in Russia and many more production and and distribution at scale and dice. Um, sure. So through our with COVAX, we're supporting the largest global 140 countries to receive our vaccine in the coming months. Um, and it's great to see other partners such as um, Pfizer and then Johnson & Johnson um, also, um, and many more, um, uh, um, to uh, who are supporting um, COVAX. Um, Pfizer is obviously already um, supplying volumes through COVAX, and we are supplying significant volumes as well at the moment. So that's something that we're really committed to, and we're really pleased to see other industry partners supporting that as well. We're supporting the supply of uh, of AZD one triple two through both our AstraZeneca supply. So we're working with manufacturers in South Korea, in China, in Europe to supply through COVAX. And Serum Institute of India is also supplying volumes of our vaccine through the COVAX facility. Um, so, so far, over 30 million doses of our vaccine has been delivered uh, to 65 countries and counting over four weeks. Um, the majority of these countries, I think around 65 to 67% are low middle income countries. Um, and as you can see, just a couple of examples from around the world, some of the countries to whom we have um, delivered. So I just wanted to, to give a very brief overview um, as uh, uh, also important for us is that we're supplying a no profit during the pandemic period, which has again been central to our initial partnership with Oxford University from the start. So hopefully that, that gives a, a brief overview of where we are and our ambition um, to continue delivering at pace, at scale, um, an, an effective vaccine for the world. Our next speaker, which is Sinan Artleg, who is with Pfizer. I just read an article this morning that uh, the data on the clinical trial for adolescence was very positive. I think it was 100% effective. And I don't know that you're prepared to talk about that, but I wanted to start off with a congratulations because I've got three kids that will fit into that category and uh, I can't wait to get them stuck. So uh, uh, Sinan is regional president of Vaccines International Development for Pfizer. Uh, so with that, I will turn things over to uh, Sinan and uh, tell us what Pfizer is doing about equitable distribution. Uh, thank you very much, Andy, and I hope you can hear me well because today internet has been a little bit fishy, so if there are connection problems, please let me know so that I can change my connection. And uh, so far it's perfect. Regarding the, regarding the data that you have referenced, uh, 
because uh, I am talking to uh, patients' associations and not healthcare professionals, I'm authorized to talk about it because we haven't received regulatory approval. So Understood. it's good news, but uh, we, are, we need to submit our data to regulatory authorities in different countries. And once it is approved, of course, then we will be able to talk more about it. Understood. Uh, so uh, to start, to introduce myself, my name is Sinan Atlik. Uh, I'm originally from Turkey and I'm the regional president for Pfizer vaccines uh, across international uh, developed markets that includes Europe, Japan, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, and today I will be talking a little bit about our story of our COVID-19 vaccine, uh, our manufacturing standards, our clinical trials, and I will finish with the equitable access part, which I know is very, very important for, for all the countries in the world. And thank you again for inviting me to speak today. And it's really a real pleasure to share our story with you all. And during my career, I have been privileged to live and work within many different countries and cultures that I have also seen today in the call. So I have lived in Latin America, in the Middle East, in North America, and now I'm on my, on my way to relocate to, to London. And I have been in touch with different patient associations during my career. And I really truly applaud all your efforts uh, in, in different countries. Our purpose at Pfizer is to deliver breakthroughs that change patients' lives. And we are very proud that in March of last year, which really doesn't sound that far away, less than a week after WHO declared COVID-19 a global pandemic, uh, we announced our collaboration with BioNTech on the development of our potential mRNA-based COVID-19 vaccine. And from the outset, we knew that we would be trying to achieve something seemingly impossible, which is developing a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine in a record-breaking timeframe. And as a result of taking many steps in parallel, and never compromising safety or efficacy, we had a vaccine approved just in nine months. And as of today, we are counting with 38 authorization across the world. And that counts Europe as one single approval within EMEA. Uh, and I also would like to emphasize the importance for us, which is the independence of regulatory bodies around the world, such as EMEA, FDA, MHRA in UK, and other agencies who really scrutinize all the data from our trials as they would for any other vaccine or medicine upholding scientific rigor. And I'm really proud to share that as of 31st of March, which is today, we have shipped 232 million doses of our vaccine to over 84 countries around the world. And just to put it into perspective, our usual supply of our other vaccines, because as Pfizer, we also manufacture other vaccines, is around 200 million doses per year. And in just three months, we have shipped more than our annual capacity to 84 countries around the world. And we are working really day and night, even to ship more and more. And our commitment is to deliver more than 2 billion doses worldwide in total by the end of 2021. Let me say something about our manufacturing process as well, which has been driven by quality expertise, confidence, and speed. When we were doing our phase three trials, we were also testing our manufacturing and supply chain processes because we were delivering to our clinical trial sites. And to do that, we developed very innovative packaging and storage solutions, which are fit for purpose for our vaccine. Uh, and our manufacturing has gone really well. We are meeting our production goals and are uh, on track to meet our dose commitments around the world. The distribution and delivery of our doses globally are within a 99.9 .9 shipping success rate. And our distribution is also very innovative. It's, it's built on a flexible just-in-time system uh, because our vials are frozen uh, and we are shipping them to the points of use, uh, 
directly to the points of use, wherever the vaccine will be used, which is minimizing the need for long-term storage. As our vaccine requires ultra low temperature storage, and you might have read it in the newspapers around minus 70 degrees, we have specially designed temperature controlled shippers. So the boxes that we ship our product uh, have dry ice in them to maintain the recommended temperature up until 10 days. And each box, each box that we ship has a GPS enabled thermal sensor so that we can check the temperature of our vaccine in each of the boxes that we are shipping across the world 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if we encounter any incursion, we can do the necessary intervention. And recently also we have received authorization from FDA and EMEA that our vaccine can be stored for two weeks at minus 25 degrees to 15 degrees, which is much more commonly found in pharmaceutical freezers and refrigerators. Uh, so uh, after talking about commercial outreach, our manufacturing and innovation, which really uh, impacts how we bring our vaccine to all the people around the world, I wanna talk about a little bit on our clinical trials. Uh, I want to emphasize that our clinical trials enrolled more than 40,000 participants, and it's a very big number. And what really makes us proud is we involved nine countries and we had racial and ethnic diversity of the countries. Uh, when we look at our participants in the US, 42% of them had racially and ethnically diverse backgrounds, and 41% of them from the 56 to 85 age group who are most at risk of severe diseases. And in addition, we are not uh, stopping. The trial is continuing to collect efficacy and safety data and that will continue for two years across 150 trial sites in the US, Germany, Turkey, South Africa, Brazil, and Argentina. Uh, and finally, uh, when it comes to equitable access, which I know is very, very important for everybody on the call, uh, I just wanna emphasize that we have been firmly committed to working towards equitable and affordable access of our vaccine for people around the world. And uh, as the speaker before me uh, shared, we also signed and announced our initial agreement with COVAX in January of 2021 to ensure equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines for all countries, regardless of income levels. Under the terms of the original agreement, both us and BioNTech, our partner, have committed to provide up to 40 million doses of our vaccine to COVAX in 2021. And for advanced market commitment countries, and they are 92, we will provide the vaccine to COVAX at a not-for-profit price. And as of March 26, like five days ago when, when I last counted, our vaccine uh, allocated through the COVAX have reached Rwanda, Korea, Colombia, Peru, Cabo Verde, Tunisia, West Bank and Gaza, Moldova, El Salvador, Mongolia, Maldives, Bosnia and Georgia. And these countries uh, have been uh, given to us uh, by COVAX. So we did not uh, take the decision of which countries to distribute to. And basically uh, it's an allocation that is designated by COVAX. And hopefully uh, in quarter two, this list will only go up. Uh, and that is really helping us to ensure that our vaccines reach the people all around the world. That goes beyond the bilateral contracts that we sign with governments. Uh, and we are also very, very happy to see that there has been significant innovation also in delivery systems around the world uh, to bring the vaccine right to the point of vaccination. Uh, and one very vivid example is the drone delivery uh, of COVAX doses uh, to hard to reach places in Ghana. So uh, just to cap it off, uh, I'm, I'm very mm, proud on, on how we are bringing our vaccine uh, to the globe. And we are really working hand in hand uh, with government authorities or with supranational organizations such as COVAX to bring our vaccine to as many countries uh, as needed. Thank you very much. 
Well, thank you so much, Sina. That was really uh, valuable information and eye-opening for sure to hear um, that the priorities of COVAX and, and of your company, um, as well as Laura's company, are to get these vaccines where they're most needed, not necessarily where uh, they can most be afforded. So thank you so much for the commitment and for your time today. Um, with that, I'm going to turn things over to Carla, our board member in Peru, CEO of Esperanta, and she is going to introduce a uh, video presentation of our next speaker. And she's then going to turn things over to Penny Cohen, who will close us out and talk to you about a couple of other things and close out the session. So um, thank you everyone uh, for listening so far and I'll turn things over to Carla. Yes, uh, good morning everybody. We having now Dr. Marta Lomazzi. She is executive manager of the World Federation of Public Health Associations. She's a medical biotechnologist by training Dr. Lomazzi has a PhD in neurosciences and postgraduate trainings in health and diplomacy and negotiations. She is the focal point of the World Federation of Public Health Associations. Um, equity, she's one of the founding members of this institution. Uh, International Immunization Policy Task Force. Beyond her activities at this institution, she's a senior researcher and lecturer at the University of Geneva and co-editor of the Journal of Public Health Federation's pages. We are happy to introduce uh, her. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you're based. My name is Marta Lomazzi. I'm the executive manager of the World Federation of Public Health Association, an NGO based in Geneva, representing over 130 national public health associations worldwide. It's my pleasure today to be here and to give you a very brief idea of the activities around the policy and advocacy that the World Federation of Public Health Association, along with its International Immunization Policy Task Force, is doing to uh, strengthen and to support an equitable approach to COVID-19 vaccination and medical tools. We have done many activities. One of those, for example, is the call to government to support the TRIPS waiver proposal to have the COVID-19 pandemic. And this call was uh, uh, developed to support a temporary suspension of the patent system for COVID-19 products until worldwide immunity is achieved. And we join our forces, our voice on the global level to really call um, governments and especially rich countries to understand this need and to make sure that we leave no one behind. This call, as well as many other calls, are available on our website at wfphe.org. But the real focus of my speech today is about the coalition of international NGO call for equitable access for vaccine and treatment during COVID-19 pandemic. The topic of this call is not new. The fact that over 30 well renewed, well known international NGOs have joined forces and joined their voices to make this need heard. This is new and this is the great achievement. On February 11, the World Federation of Public Health Association has hosted an historic meeting, of course, a Zoom meeting due to the pandemic hosting the leaders of these uh, very important NGOs. And we all share the same concern. Governments around the world are struggling to find ways to work together and control the pandemic. Virus does not recognize national boundaries. We have now knowledge and evidences. But still many governments are not applying the evidences. And disparities that have always been there are now exacerbated between and within countries. 
we all stand together for equity and to support WHO and its vaccine equity declaration. Because to move forward now, we need a greater global mobilization and a real collaboration between cross-national organizations and also innovative solutions that will leave no one behind. Our call was organized around three main areas. First, equity and access. Second, environmental and economic sustainability. And third, real intersectoral and intergenerational collaboration. So, so first one, equity and um, accessibility. What we did together was to call to policymakers, governments, the World Health Assembly, the G20, to have more and equitable access to vaccine, to increase healthcare, public health, and social protection workforce, and to address the national and international spending priorities during the pandemic. Second, sustainability. We need to stop uncoordinated and social, economic, and system dynamics. We need to maximize vaccine production, distribution, and uptake. And we call to guarantee an environmental and economically sustainable and equitable production and distribution of the vaccine. And third, we need to have real intergenerational and intersectoral collaboration, engaging all groups in the society, including the youth and young professional key stakeholders and health professionals in the decision-making process and implementation. And we need to have the civil society, patient organization, and the broader public health across communities to address communication, including risk communication, and tackling misinformation and combating hesitancy at every level. When at the beginning I say the milestone is to have all together very new, important international NGOs joining forces for equity, for COVID-19 vaccination and medical tools, this is what I have in mind. Have a look to this list. It's amazing. And it's just the beginning. We will meet again to implement a statement to do the next step for the COVID-19 pandemic management and for the recovery afterwards and far beyond after once this pandemic will be ended. If you or your organization are willing to join us, feel free to do so and to contact me. We need more and more NGOs joining us in this call and in this work to make sure to leave really no one behind. Thank you very much. That was that was great. Um, thank you very much. And just before I even get into the this, I'm sorry, this is Penny Cowan, um, one of the board members at uh, WPA. I wanted to sort of give an overview of our speakers this morning. We heard from Laura Mann about to ensure broad and equitable access to all people, and and how and she shared how they're going to accomplish that, which I think was really important for us to hear. And then from um, Nay at Atlick, we heard from who he was part of Pfizer. They actually started working as soon as the WHO declared the pandemic uh, back in, in early March. They began development with biotech of their vaccine. And what I find extremely amazing, because I work in a lot of clinical trials and understand that the length of time it takes for all of this within nine months they had was amazing. So currently they have distributed it to more than 84 countries, 2 million, over 2 million doses. And their goal by the end of this year is to get 2 billion doses. So as we look at this pandemic and what it's done to everyone's life on a global level, this is an amazing uh, accomplishment. And we're hoping that it continues and we all reach herd immunity. They he talked about the way that they ship it safely and that the temperature of the vaccine they've, they've realized can go 
um, from that 70 below down to 25 below, I believe. And then even in their clinical trials, the diversity that they were able to achieve. And that, that is something that's extremely difficult to do. So again, I take my hat off to them to be able to test this on a, on a really broad, uh, diverse group of people. And then lastly, we heard from Marta Lomaza, and I apologize for uh, messing up people's names. And she talked about um, the waivers that they worked on uh, for COVID and, and the fact that they leave no one behind. And I always like to hear those kinds of things. And then she talked about um, working with NGOs. Many of you are part, all of you are part of that and how they were going to distribute vaccines. And they did it between with equitable access to the vaccine, environmental and uh, economic and how they were gonna do that. And then collaborations on all levels. So we, again, we wanna thank all of our speakers. It was great to hear all of you. Um, so let's go and look at this, this survey that we're running right now. Um, it's health technology assessment and, and one of the things that the WPA and the reason we even started this organization is because of people, patients that need to have their voice heard. So through this survey, what we believe is that health technology access, assessment can provide that information regarding multiple access, aspects, I'm sorry, of healthcare that will have a positive impact on the way patients' lives and how they're treated. However, in order to push that, the patient voice needs to be heard. We need to hear from the actual patients. What is their experience? And that is really a critical part. And then to properly develop assessment processes that can favor the establishment of a truly patient-centered healthcare system that covers quality and safety comprehensively and promotes, and this, I, I love this, get it right the first time culture. That is so important because even though we hear so much about, you know, the practice of medicine, we want to make sure that we get it right, that we do the best for each one of you, because no matter how far people go, how it, it, it's about that one individual. And when it's your body and your health, that's what we're focused on is that one individual. Um, so in order to accomplish that, right now our survey, we have 87 uh, respondents to our survey, but we'd like to have a lot more given the number of members that we have. If you have not, or your members have not, please fill out the survey. I encourage them to do it. You can go right to our website. There's a link to it. Uh, there was a couple emails that were sent out with the blast email and you can just link right onto that. If you wanna share it again a second time, sometimes people need a reminder. It'd be a great idea to do that maybe early next week to send it out again, or even today. I don't know if it's, I mean, it's still very early here in California, but either today or tomorrow, it'd be a great to be able to share it. Uh, so our webinars, series. This is the second one that we've had. And so far, our focus has been on COVID-19 because of the impact, again, as I said, it's had on all of our lives across the globe. Uh, we want to talk about the response to the, vac to, to the COVID, the vaccines, and new development. So as we move forward with these webinars, look for more information, up-to-date information, and, and appropriate information that will be able to help you and your members really better understand how to cope with this. Uh, we're we're going to look to external experts like we heard today and we heard in our first uh, webinar. We do record these. So even if you were not able or some of your members or people, you know, were not able to attend this meeting, give us a little time to make sure that the recording is all perfect. The first one is on our website. This one will be on our website site and on the WPA um, YouTube channel will be available on the YouTube channel and I believe there's a link right from our website uh, and they will occur bi-monthly that's every other month for the year 2021 so our next webinar will probably be sometime in late May so look forward to um, new announcements on on who all speakers will be the focus of that webinar and we really hope that you'll continue to join us. I know today we had over 90 people registered. 
that increases at another half of what we had our first webinar. So we're hoping to get even more of our members involved. So to stay connected, and I know this slide is just going to, you know, you can't click on them from here. I always get frustrated when I see that. But these are on our web page as well at theworldpatientalliance.org. So all you have to do is, you know, look either at our Facebook for all kinds of update information, not just on COVID, but all the other things, what's going on in different countries, uh, on Twitter. And if you have anything to share, please send it in and we'll, we'll review it and hopefully be able to share it with the rest of the members and then also on LinkedIn. So for more information, visit www.worldpatientsalliance.org or email us at office at worldpatientalliance.org. I know we didn't leave time for questions today. We never know how long the speakers are going to be to talking. And I see that, you know, we have a little bit of time left over. Unfortunately, we don't have the capacity today to do the, the Q&A. Uh, but, you know, again, you never know how long people are going to talk. So we didn't want to, to rush our speakers. So, you know, if you have any questions, or you need any comments, just email us and we'll try to get back to you as soon as we can. So with that, what we'd like to do is to really thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy days, your mornings, your evenings to join us for this. Uh, without you, there would be no World Patient Alliance. So know how much we value you, we value your membership, uh, and we look forward to you joining us at the next webinar in late March. Again, thank you very much and please stay safe and be well.